Now you're watching ITV News Central, still to come on the programme. We catch up with comedian Alan Davis before his big gig in Coventry tonight. Now though, if you were watching us yesterday, you may remember that we revisited Tamworth, which has worked hard to shed the unwanted title of Fat Capital of Britain. They're taking obesity seriously there, but what about trying to tackle it at a much younger age? Well, we know some schools already ask children to bring in healthy snacks for break time, but how would you feel if your school went one step further and started removing chocolate, crisps and other treats from your child's lunchbox? In a moment, your views. But first, Seth Conway reports from a school that's doing exactly that. When crisps and a small chocolate bar were confiscated by teachers from the packed lunch of Rob Lott's children, he was furious, and he's not the only parent to feel this way. From this term, the governors at his boys' school have instructed teachers to rifle through the lunch boxes. We are more than happy with the idea of promoting healthy eating, encouraging healthy eating, and we have no, no issue with that. What's happened this year, uh, the school has gone from encouraging to enforcing, um, which we're obviously unhappy about. Um, things are being removed from my children's lunch boxes that we, I, as a parent, have put there for them to eat um, without my consent. Most schools in the region have a healthy eating policy, and that also applies to packed lunches brought from home. We are responsible for what happens during the school day whilst children are with us in our care. So we are not taking food away, we give it back to them at the end of the day, but we're saying whilst you're at school, we'd really like to encourage healthy habits. Well, the school's policy has certainly created some controversy. Whole grain sandwiches, a dairy item, fruit and vegetables are fine. But fruit juice, high salt items, sweet cereal bars and white bread may be confiscated if they're included more than once in a week. Crisps, sweets, chocolate and sugary drinks are banned. The rules have split opinions at the school gate. We've raised them for six, six plus years. We, sh we should know what is acceptable to be put into a lunchbox and not. But it feels like at the minute that all your rights as a parent have just been taken away. If you take a look at their school menu, it's all wrong foods on it. You, you've got battered fish on it, pizza on it, bakewell tart, chocolate puddings. But I'm not allowed to put a penguin in their lunchbox. It just doesn't balance out in my head. It suits me. I'm happy for my child to not have crisps. We, we're all guilty of giving our child treats at some time, but at the end of the day, they've got to be healthy. Any schools with this policy substitute food so the children don't go hungry, but it's left a bad taste in the mouth of some parents. Seth Conway, ITV News. It's a tricky one, isn't it? It's spark. It is. Yeah, much debate. If your child will only eat a white bread jam sandwich... What do you do? That's yeah, what they'll you might eat. welcome the healthy option. Absolutely. Well, you've been sharing your thoughts on our uh, Facebook page today. Let's uh, share a few of those with you now. Uh, Claire Louise Haywood from Willenhall says, as long as a child isn't overweight and eats healthily at home, what's wrong with a treat at school, she says. However, Lucy Dyke from Wolverhampton disagrees and says, leave our kids alone. Not all parents feed their children junk all the time. What if their lunchbox was the only time we gave them a treat of a chocolate bar, etc.? Leave parents to parent their children. Uh, Sonia Hart from Rugby says, never mind going through kids' lunch bags. They ought to be checking the staff room <laughs> where there are cakes, biscuits, tea and coffee galore. What a cheek. And uh, on Twitter, Andrew Wakeman writes, Nanny State again. Uh, thank you to everybody for getting in touch. This uh, debate continues ferociously yes. on our Facebook page. Do get involved and have your say. I've got a craving now for a white bread jam sandwich. Yes, Is that wrong? you can have it after okay. the programme. With a banana, obviously. Yeah. Uh, now, still to come uh, on the programme, we catch up with comedian and actor Alan Davis ahead of his Coventry gig later tonight. First, though, here is Michael with a preview of the weekend sport. Hello, Thanks, Michael. Well, I might join you in that jam sandwich, Mike. <laughs> it know. sounds very appetising. I'm not sharing it. <laughs> Get your own. Well, coming up on the sport, we've got the return from injury of one of our region's most high-profile footballers and the former Wolf star getting back on his fundraising bike. ITV Central Sports Report, sponsored by WeWantAnyCard.com, the Cash for Cars website. Now, it's been a big turnaround at the Hawthorns already this season. West Brom have won their last three games in the league after struggling to blend their 11 new signings in the early part of the campaign. But manager Alan Irvine is tempering expectations for a result against Liverpool tomorrow, despite a disappointing defeat for them in the Champions League during the week. 
I expect that this will be a really tough game for us. I think you just have to listen to how Stephen Gerrard talked after the game and, and realise that, that they were disappointed with, with what happened last night. And usually when a team like Liverpool are disappointed with what happened in one game, they, they respond in the next game. Aston Villa striker Christian Benteke could make his return to action this weekend after being named in the 23-man squad to face Manchester City tomorrow. The Belgium international has been out since April with a ruptured Achilles, but scored on his return to the under-21 side early this week. Villa have lost their last two games 3-0. Rugby now and Leicester Tigers are looking to bounce back from two of the most surprising defeats in their recent history. The club were thumped 45-0 uh, at Bath and then lost to a team at home that hadn't beaten them in their previous 10 attempts. Our sports correspondent Steve Clamp has been asking the club if there's a crisis. For a team so used to winning and so often champions, the last fortnight has come as quite a shock. Losing by a club record margin at Bath, 45 points to nothing. It has turned into a complete rut. Before a home match against London Irish, themselves without a win at Welford Road in a decade, only to suffer another defeat, albeit a much closer one. The tries awarded. For those Tigers fans who watch their team every week on the ITV Highlights programme, it must have seemed unbelievable to watch their side crumble 45 nothing at Bath only to then be defeated here at the home of Leicester Tigers must have seemed like some kind of cruel camera trickery. But it wasn't. It was real. So it's down to this man to put things right. But Richard Cockerell has little time for those criticising the team over the last couple of weeks. If they look at the facts, they'll understand why there's some issues. If they don't look at the facts, then just look at the result. Maybe they have a slightly um, uneducated opinion of what the situation is. Injuries have been a major thorn in the Tigers' side, with key players on the sidelines. However, Jordan Crane is one of those battling on. He's only broken his nose. We're, we're not pe pressing the panic buttons. We're not having crisis meetings, things like that. It's, there's no need. There's a lot of experienced guys who have been in similar situations. I remember my second year here, we were seventh last game of the season with 10 minutes to go. And we still end up in the grand final. So, you know, it's not it's not a time to panic. It's a time to batten down the hatches and and consolidate from within and, and go from there. Next up, Gloucester. They include former Tiger Billy Twelve Trees in their ranks. His side have also won two and lost two this season. It's always in the memory bank that I've been there and they've got friends there. And, um, you know, a lot of teams move on just like uh, teams have done here. And there's a... A lot of new faces there, I don't know, but a lot of familiar faces as well. But, um, you know, they're a great club with great traditions and it's the same as Gloucester. And, um, you know, we're just looking forward to whoever they're bringing to give them a real challenge. But he's a good lad. He's, he's the captain of the side. He's obviously, you know, done well since he's left us. And, you know, he's, he's a good player. We, we wanted him to stay here. He didn't stay. He's, he's done well at Gloucester. And, um, and, and that's just, that's life sometimes. It's a massive game, massive game at King's Home big history Gloucester's got and um, it's going to be a big game it's always tough down there so we're looking forward to it and it's a good chance to, to put, put ourselves back in a good good spot in the league So both sides have a point to prove on Saturday well, Where did that come from? Yeah, Leicester could really do with a win there. Now, finally, former Wolves midfielder Jeff Thomas has announced he's to ride the Tour de France course to raise money for leukaemia research 10 years after he first took on the great cycle race. Jeff was diagnosed with the disease shortly after his retirement from football in 2003, but recovered and has been raising money for leukaemia research ever since. I caught up with him as he announced his latest challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Jeff Thomas. Jeff Thomas knows what it's like to be told you have blood cancer. In 2003, doctors said he had less than three years to live, but now it's thought he's the only professional English sportsman to have beaten his form of leukaemia. In 2005, just months after a stem cell transplant saved his life, Jeff decided to take on the Tour de France course. He cycled nearly 3,500 kilometres in 21 days, the same time it takes the professional riders. This week, he's announced he's doing it again, 10 years on. You become a positive for people. Like, I, I took positives from people who had, had thankfully made it, you know, and that's, that's what you become a survivor. And then when you do more things and you've 
I've got, I did have some profile in football and that helped and people looked up to me then when I was fighting back, did the tour and they thought, wow, if he can do that, I can do this, surely. It's going to be as close to being on the actual tour as it can possibly get. They'll be 24 hours ahead of the real riders with rolling roadblocks and support teams. There'll be 20 others with him. They'll have to commit to raising £50,000 each. The money is going to help this man, Professor Charles Craddock. He led Jeff's treatment and now wants to raise £2 million to help save more lives. The most important thing this money is going to do is it's going to allow us to open up many more clinical trials so that we don't turn patients away from access to potentially new and life-saving therapies. Jeff is also leading a four-day London to Paris challenge next year ahead of the tour, an event that anyone can sign up to. Despite the big year ahead, the training hasn't started yet. It's a, like a love-hate relationship, this training. Even when I was playing football, you know, pre-season was one of the things that you didn't enjoy, but that, that feeling of getting to that next level of fitness, it, that, that was makes all the pain worthwhile and it's very similar when you're on a bike. Injury hampered his time at Wolves but now it's cycling and lots of it that takes up his time. A new lease of life for a man who was told 10 years ago he didn't have much of it left.